trailer or two, but I think they'll be in here in just a little bit. So in the interest of time, I think we need to move on. Uh, if you open up your program that you, you got over at your seat, you notice there were a number of announcements in there. We do those announcements for a number of reasons. One, we think they're important. And two, we have space on the program to fill. Uh, there are a couple of those announcements that I want to um, kind of emphasize a little bit. The, the first one there about Match Day. Uh, I think many of you are aware of what Match Day is. The Mound Ridge Community Foundation uh, always puts up and has for the last number of years puts up matching money uh, that, uh, on a, that, that it, you know, that if we match or what we bring in donations on a given day, and this year it's November 2 of 2017, if we bring that, if, if we bring in dollars then, they will match them, or at least uh, match them according to a formula. So it's a very easy way to make your money grow. Uh, we, uh, we have been very successful. You have, as a, as a group, you have done very well over the past. Uh, we've always come up in the top tier of, of, of uh, groups in terms of the amount of money that we've raised and the amount of match that we secured, and we hope that we'll be able to do that again this year. Uh, so remember, on November the 2nd, from 12 noon to 6 p.m. at Quincy's in, in Mound Ridge, uh, they, there will be representatives of the uh, Community Foundation there who will receive your gifts and hopefully in the name of Schmecka. And, we, and this money, uh, if you know it on your program, we're going to be uh, starting a fund which we'll, which we'll use for developing the centennial uh, marker about a mile or so down the road here. There seems to be quite a bit of interest in the uh, location of the immigrant house and uh, what it might have looked like and where it might have been. And so we want to work on that project and, and uh, other developments in that, on that particular property. So remember, match day. And if you, if you can't uh, be there, Barbara, you can give, a check, give checks to Barbara, and she will take them up to the, to the desk on, uh, on, on t next, well, it's a week from today, I guess, next Thursday. Uh, just to mention, the annual meeting will be at Pretty Prairie this year on March 11th. And of course, you need to have your dues paid up. Uh, we always encourage people to visit the historical sites uh, west of Mound Ridge. I think they're really looking good. Uh, if you haven't been by there for a while, they're really cleaned up and neatly mowed. Uh, we've even made an impression on McPherson County. They don't park their grader and high loader on our property anymore. So, uh, so that's, uh, uh, we've, we've, you know, we've, we've come a long way. Now, so take a look at those. They're your sites and you can enjoy them. The, uh, the, the other thing that we need to mention is the web. I think, the fact is, I think most of us uh, on, the, on the board think that probably the web is the most underused thing that we have. Uh, the, uh, the website for the organization is SwissMennonite.org. Just go to, uh, go to it on your computer and there's just a treasure trove of material there for you to look at. Last year, the, uh, the money from Match Day went to uh, digitize uh, some books that were out of, out of print. And uh, a couple of those have been put on the, on the web. There are articles about people. There are articles about the cemetery. There's uh, yeah, the, uh, who all is buried and where they're buried in the, in the Hopefield Cemetery. And just about anything that you want to know about about uh, Swiss Wahinian Mennonites is, is on the website. And if it isn't there, you can call it to our attention and you can help get it there. Now, as usual, we have a uh, table with books for sale. I already mentioned that Kathy wanted you to buy a recipe book and I think, she, I think you probably did. But uh, uh, we have a number of books for sale and you can look over those and if you have an interest in 
in some of that material, we'd certainly encourage you to buy it. It's uh, it's it's good stuff, and and uh, uh, we you know the the James Crable book, the Martin Schrag book, all these are are uh, are, are books about uh, our history and our background that's uh, important and significant. Now, one of the things that's kind of a uh, in some ways a blemish is our scholarship. We have we we provide a scholarship or try to provide a scholarship every year for a uh, a person from one of the with with a uh, a Swiss Vahinian background who wants to go into uh, some sort of full-time Christian service. We've uh, and this year we didn't get any applicants. Now, I know that $1,000 isn't a lot of money, and it won't buy a year of school, but it'll sure help. So if you know somebody who's, who would kind of meet the qualifications, let them know, give, put a bug in their ear, and uh, come next spring, maybe we can get this scholarship uh, filled. I think that's all the time I'm going to take for announcements. We, I could probably talk here for a long time, but we have other things that uh, are probably more important that we need to deal with. One of the things that I've noticed recently is we get a lot of information from signs. The other day, Marilyn and I were driving along Interstate I-35 from Wichita to Newton, and we went past where the uh, Don Hatton Chevrolet place is, and there was a sign up there that said, Tuesday, Ladies' Day. You go by past uh, the the bank and they have on their sign they'll say free checking or something like that and other businesses do the same thing churches have kind of gotten into that some and they have their 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 thing out uh, you know their 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 sign board out i saw one the other day that said cremation is your last chance to have a smoking hot body and uh, another one I noticed, uh, whoever stole our air conditioning units, keep one. Where you're going, it'll be hot. But the one I liked best was Adam and Eve were the first person not to read the Apple terms and conditions. So uh, signs tell us a lot. And uh, Schmeck has been involved in, in, in putting up signs. We put them up to note where our properties are. Just this last, um, uh, oh, about six weeks ago, we put up a marker at the, out here, at, at the uh, 1943 marker that tells a little bit about the background of that, and I'm going to read what that marker says. It says, the marker at this location was erected in 1943 during World War II to express gratitude to the United States of America for showing hospitality to the Swiss Bohemian Mennonites who uh, immigrated to this era circa 1874. The front of the stone uh, describes the events and issues uh, and issues a statement of thanks. The back of the stone contains a list of the surnames of people who were part of that initial migration. In a joint effort, Hopefield Mennonite Church, Eden Mennonite Church, and First Mennonite Church of Christian erected this marker. The site is on land initially donated by, to the immigrants by, for church purposes by the Santa Fe Railroad. The sign is owned and the grounds are maintained by the Swiss Mennonite Cultural and Historical Association. If someone stops and takes a look at that marker, that tells a lot about what, why it's there and what it's, what it, what it, what it means. There's another sign down the road here that uh, uh, says a lot, right at the corner of Aztec and 18th Avenue. This is a sign that's changed a lot over the years. Uh, a few years ago, the sign read Hopefield Mennonite Church. Now the sign reads Hopefield Church. That says a lot. And I've asked Glenn Gearing to share about memories about the Hopefield Church and our rich history. We normally would have a segment, and even in your, in your program, it says we have a segment about Eden. But, but we have decided to um, showcase Hopefield 
we'll probably never have an opportunity to go there for a meeting or for, an op for a, a get-together like this. They have a rich history, and we want to find out a little bit more about it. So, Glenn, let's, uh, let's hear about Hope Field. You know, when Laverne asked if, if I would do this, I kind of asked, well, you know, why me? And uh, I've, I've been asking that a lot. But, uh, uh, you know, I was born and I had my early development years at Hopefield. I was baptized in the Hopefield congregation. Um, and we just are a little different, I think. We have a little different history. But uh, coming here tonight, and this is our current church that we attend, you should imagine my aghast when I looked at the program and I was supposed to give a program, a presentation on Eden church history. So, so I was hoping that the research that I've done the past few weeks wouldn't be in vain. Anyway, well here we go. By the fall of 1873, because of political and government changes, plans were made by the Kodosufka Mennonite Congregation of Russia to migrate to the plains of Kansas. Upon their arrival in 1874, the name Huffnesfeld, or Hopefield, was chosen for the newly settled congregation. The first winter, the immigrant house, a structure 20 by 120 feet, which was built by the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad, was to serve as a residence and place of worship. In the following eight years, the Immigrant House became the congregation's community and education center as well as their place of worship. The new church building was completed in 1882, located just east of the then existing Immigrant House. Something of note, in my research I found none of the wood from the Immigrant House was used in the construction of the new church building. You'd think, you know, we're pretty thrifty people, but that did not happen. I found, however, there are some early accounts of a used lumber sale. And I think it's really interesting to think that some of our area buildings could be constructed with salvaged lumber from that old immigrant house. The new church building served the Hopefield congregation through the first century and into the next. Most of the original building exists today and still can be seen. Through the years, many remodeling projects were undertaken, and they are too numerous to list all tonight. Some major improvements include, in 1904, a heater was installed in the small room, and another in the main church. Now, when I attended there, there was way more than just a small room in a main church. In 1913, 200 trees were purchased and planted. The walls and ceilings were covered with decorative tin and a floor furnace was installed. In 1935, electric lights were added. It was then resolved in 1941 to build a basement. This basement was dug and poured just south of the original building site. When completed, the building was simply moved over onto the waiting basement. My dad mentioned on occasion that he was a teenager at that time and he helped with that project. I can't even imagine he and my uncle in, in shovel duty shoveling dirt to each other. I think most of it would have probably ended up on each other. In 1946, a cornerstone was placed on the northwest corner of the structure. The inscription simply reads, Huffnesfeld Church, 1882. In 1952, another interior remodel was performed. The old tin, the now old tin ceiling and wall coverings were removed and replaced with ceiling board, and the front of the church was also modified. Foam padding for the pews and new carpeting were added in 1973. At this time, my favorite improvement was added, and that was much needed central air conditioning. For over a century, Hopefield has been a place of worship, Christian education, 
and fellowship. The Anabaptist ideology taught here has served well in the foreign mission fields and in local service. Hopefield, being the first Swiss Volhanian Mennonite church in Kansas, has been called the mother church, with descendant congregations at Christian, Burns, McPherson, Pretty Prairie, Kingman, and here at Eden. This truly historic church's legacy is celebrated with the Swiss Mennonite Cultural Historical Association's custody of the Hopefield Cemetery, the 1943 marker, and the Centennial Monument for all future generations to see and appreciate. We mourn that the current Hopefield congregation no longer considers themselves part of the Swiss Mennonite tradition. But we can take great comfort that the Hopefield legacy lives on in the number of descendant congregations that have been fostered. And also the great number of us who have found our own faith by the teachings and witness of the congregation of the Hopefield Mennonite Church.
at this time, there's a reason you were given a sheet of paper with some words on it. That's a little tune, Gottes de Liebe, which I'm sure most of you know. Um, my grandma Kaufman sang that with us and, and herself many, many times. So we'd like you to join with us in singing Gottes de Liebe, uh, one verse in German and then the English as well. Kind of brings back memories. Now, I didn't sing, but then I know better than to ruin what a good thing, so. But I'd sure fun to listen. Thank you, ladies, for being just friends and for singing for us. I'm excited about our speaker this evening. Schmecka has worked hard and long for the privilege of having Dale address us. Dale comes to us as one of us. He probably shares DNA with and some genes with nearly everyone in this group. And let it be known that Dale's father did not cross the Turkey Creek until after he was married. Uh, I tried to find a blemish in Dale. I found out he's about as much Schweitzer as possible. The only blemish I found on his genetic record was back six generations ago, that's three great-grandpas, when Christian Stuckey married Katerina Mundelheim. Now, I'm sure Katerina Mundelheim was a, was a, was a, was a catch, and I'm sure that uh, she, was, she was a much sought-after young lady but she was not Schweitzer. So there's one blemish in his record. Now, go ahead. her family, though, however, kind of compensated for this because they were local nobility and they had changed from Catholic to, to Mennonite a few years earlier. And I try to put this in perspective a little bit. You know, one nun one slight blemish out of 64 pairs of people. That's kind of like playing the final four or playing the, the, the March Madness tournament and winning the first game in the final four. You're almost perfect, but not quite. So anyway, we are very excited to have Dale here there's a, a uh, biography, short biography, in, his, in your program. Dale was a major voice at Bethel College in recent years. Even in retirement, Dale uh, currently is involved with Bethel. 
along with playing the role of super grandpa. Uh, Dale has indicated that he's very happy to have the grandkids close to him and that life is good. Now Dale needs no introduction to Eden here at Eden the Mennonite Church because Dale is a product of Eden Mennonite Church. And so tonight Dale will address us on the topic searching for a usable past. So please join me in welcoming to this Schmecker microphone, Dale Schrag. Well, thank you, Laverne. I count it a privilege, <clears throat> excuse me, to have the chance. Here we go again. My dad used to do this. How many of you remember my dad having to clear his throat every time he needed to talk? <clears throat> you could do worse than being like Richard Schrag, I guess. Uh, I count it a privilege to be able to speak to you tonight. Uh, you know, Laverne acts like you've been trying to get me for years. Uh, you ought to have better ways of spending your energy. Um, but it's true that I haven't been the most faithful attender of this organization's events. And I'll actually say a little bit about, in, about that in what you're about to hear. But when Laverne called and asked me this time, I was in the shower, and Margot came and handed me the phone, and uh, Laverne said, Dale, we understand that you're trying to raise money for the Mennonite Library and Archives at Bethel College, and uh, boy, Schmecka would really love to have you come and talk about the Mennonite Library and Archives at Bethel College. Well, I'll call that bet. But anyway, <clears throat> I am going to talk a little bit about the Mennonite Library and Archives at Bethel College, but I'm going to take a very circuitous way to get there. So uh, you'll just have to hang with me. In early May of 1969, I submitted a 37-page research paper to Dr. Keith Sprunger in partial fulfillment for the requirements of the course Social Science Seminar at Bethel College. Entitled Anabaptism, A Search for a Usable Past, the research and writing of that paper was arguably the most transformative research project of my life, more so even than the 232-page master's thesis I submitted 15 years later. Why so transformative? Because in the course of that research and writing during the academic year 1968-69, I became a convinced and convicted Mennonite. A Mennonite not because I was the son of Richard and Lizzie Schrag, not even because I was a baptized member of Eden Mennonite Church. A Mennonite because I discovered in those Anabaptists a theology and practice that made eloquent and convincing theological sense. Indeed, I often compare that experience to the story of Lauren Schwarzendruber's Mennonite conversion, a story that I suspect most of you have heard since I tell it at every opportunity. I want every Mennonite in the United States, indeed the world, to hear this story. So, on the outside chance that a couple of you haven't heard it, I'll tell it again. Lauren, you may recall, grew up on a farm near Kelowna, Iowa. He attended Iowa Mennonite School, and when he graduated, his father gave him two options for college, Heston College or Eastern Mennonite College. It was a college back then. Lauren didn't want to go to either one. He wanted to go 30 miles up the road to the University of Iowa, because that's where his sweetheart, Pat Schwarzendruber, was going. And yes, she was also a Schwarzendruber. 
But he trundled off to EMC, had an awful year because he spent most of the time pining for Pat. Next year, his dad relented and he transferred to the University of Iowa. He and Pat soon married, and after sporadic attendance at First Mennonite Church in Iowa City, they began attending regularly an evangelical free church in the suburbs. They were very active, youth sponsors. Lorne was named an elder, the youngest elder in the history of that congregation. Eventually, Lauren felt called to the ministry and applied and was accepted at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Deerfield, Illinois. Before moving to Illinois, however, Lauren stopped in at First Mennonite Church to bid farewell to Pastor Ed Stolzfus and presumably to bid farewell to the Mennonite Church of his youth. Ed listened to Lauren's story, then got up from his chair, walked to his bookcase, and pulled out this book. <clears throat> he made Lauren promise to read this book from cover to cover. Lauren did, Pat did, and they found their church. Not because their last name was Schwarzendruber, nor because the book had good recipes for shoe fly pie but because they found within its pages an eloquent and convincing theology. So Lauren did go to seminary, but he went back to Harrisonburg, Virginia, to Eastern Mennonite Seminary, and then on to a distinguished career as a Mennonite pastor and Mennonite college president. So I'm reluctant to belittle in any way that social science seminar paper I handed in in May of 1969 but I want to go back to its title. In 1969, I thought it an absolutely brilliant title. I remember meeting Keith Sprunger in his office in the early spring of that year to talk about my research. He asked me if I had chosen a title. I proudly said, <coughs> Anabaptism, a search for a usable past. I didn't say it like that, but I wanted to. I waited for him to say, oh, Dale, that's brilliant. Instead, he was quiet a moment, and then he said, borrowing from Henry Steele Commager's essay, I see. I knew the name, Henry Steele Commager, but I'd never read the essay. Nevertheless, I muttered some kind of agreement, and our discussion of the research continued. I distinctly remember walking out of that tiny office in the southeast corner of the administration building thinking, he sure didn't seem very impressed with my title. I've never asked Keith why he wasn't impressed. But once I finally read Commager's essay, long after I graduated from Bethel, I might add, I have my suspicions. In the essay, Commager argues that in contrast to the nations of Europe, the new America had no history, no past. Oh, indeed, it had a Native American past. But the doctrine of discovery dictated that those indigenous people didn't count. In fact, as uncivilized heathens, they were scarcely people. So these white European colonists had to make their own usable past. The task, according to Commager, fell not to historians, but to literary types, writers and artists. Commager concludes his essay with these words, and what a past it was, splendid, varied, romantic, and all but blameless in which there were heroes but no villains, victories but no defeats, a past that was all prologue to the rising glory of America. Now, I may be wrong, but I'm guessing that is the American past that most of us learned in elementary school, and very likely in high school as well. Scholars may have had a much more realistic and accurate view of the American past and its considerable flaws, 
But I don't think the average American was aware in any meaningful sense. Oh yes, there had been slavery, but the doctrine of discovery could be interpreted to suggest that we had done the Africans a favor by bringing them to Christianity and civilization. And besides, slavery had been outlawed by the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. It's all good. And then along came the 1960s. Whether it was in response to the Vietnam War, as Ken Burns and Lynn Novick seem to imply in their masterful film on Vietnam, or simply a case of ideas whose time had come, that usable past that Commager describes came under serious attack. Works aimed not at scholars, but at the general public began to appear and were widely read. D. Brown's Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee told the story of settling the West from a Native American perspective. It was a story of cruelty and genocide that most definitely had villains and occasional defeats. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring exposed a long history of environmental degradation. And light was shined on the unconscionably ugly history of slavery, its impact and its aftermath, with popular works like John Howard Griffin's Black Like Me, which seemed to prove conclusively that people in this country were judged by the color of their skin rather than by the content of their character. And the movement for civil rights led by men like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Cesar Chavez kept these issues front and center before the general public. In fact, I wonder if one cannot claim that the search for a usable past described by Commager is not a major cause of the political dysfunction that currently characterizes this country. A certain percentage of the populace wants desperately to return to that positive and romantic vision of the American past that Commager describes by overlooking or ignoring the considerable evidence to the contrary. An opposing percentage of the population is so focused on the evidence to the contrary that they can scarcely acknowledge anything good or heroic or noble in that American past. Is this why Keith Sprunger was less than enthusiastic about the title of my seminar paper? Is there something intrinsically wrong with trying to fashion a usable past? I'm inclined to say there may be. Almost by definition, it suggests ignoring or disputing or at least forgetting any and all historical facts that negate or diminish the idealized past that one has fashioned. Indeed, totalitarian regimes throughout history have effectively insisted on constructing just such a usable past and dismissing or discounting any and all evidence to the contrary. But as Timothy Wangert suggested in his final Menno Simons lecture at Bethel College three weeks ago, such forgetfulness or nefarious intentionality never serves us well. The best antidote to this carefully constructed usable past, says Wangert, is history itself and the careful telling of that history. We might add the comprehensively accurate telling of that history. We need to get the whole story. So where does this leave my seminar paper in 1969? I don't think I ignored or forgot or disputed any part of the 16th century Anabaptist story in that paper. I must, however, freely confess that my enthusiasm for the Anabaptist story contributed to my ignoring or dismissing much of the subsequent 450 years of Mennonite history and culture. 
that subsequent history simply could not measure up to my idealized, usable past of 16th century Anabaptism. But in so doing, in my suspicion of genealogy and ethnic identity, in my suspicion of Schmecke, I was clearly not considering the whole story. And as Tim Wangert suggests, that story needs to be told in its entirety. To take just one example, in the last few years, two books have been published making it abundantly clear that Mennonites have been profoundly influenced by the cultures in which they find themselves. Mark Jansen's Mennonite German Soldiers and Ben Gosen's Chosen Nation reveal how quickly the Mennonite commitment to pacifism and nonviolence can dissipate in a radically nationalistic and militaristic culture. This fact should give American Mennonites pause as we observe the direction our country appears to be headed. But it also may provide some clues to the unique past of this congregation, Eden Mennonite Church. One of the enduring mysteries surrounding that group of Swiss Volinian Mennonites who sailed on the city of Richmond in August of 1874 is the radical church split that occurred a mere 20 years after they landed. I confess I don't know that much about this history. Remember, I've ignored it, lo, these many years. <clears throat> But I'm wondering if Jansen and Gosen's finding about the power of the prevailing culture on Mennonite values and practices provides a clue. Our tendency is to assume homogeneity among those emigres on the city of Richmond. After all, they were all members of the Stuckey Gemeinde, and they all loved Bonabruggi. The truth of the matter, however, is that the families on that ship did not have uniform histories. There were two distinct streams of Swiss Mennonites, streams that finally came together in Volhynia, or did they? There may even have been differences at the very outset. Some of these folks came originally from Canton Zurich in Switzerland. After all, we've got Zurichers here. Others, probably most, came from Canton Bern. In the 16th century, these two cantons were, in essence, different states, different nations, if you will. They were both part of the Swiss Confederation, they were both Protestant, but they were not the same nation. Each would have sent its own diplomats to negotiate with the powers of Europe and with each other. Some of our ancestors emigrated to Alsace, some to the Palatinate in Germany, some to Montbelliard in France. Some eventually settled in Karasufka, some eventually settled in Neumannufka. Now conventional wisdom suggests that these two villages, Karasufka and Neumannufka, more or less merged into one even though they were three miles apart with a little forest in between them. And Katasufka became the chosen moniker. So you won't find the name Neumannufka on any monuments two miles south of here or in the capsule history of Eden Mennonite Church that one finds on its website. But is that an accurate record? We know there was a major falling out between Elder Jacob Stuckey and Peter M. Crable. We know that both Elder Jacob Stuckey and Jacob Gehring had roots in Montbelliard. We know that all the Crables came from the Palatinate, no matter if they spell their name K-R-Y-B-I-L-L, like the former MCs, or if they spell it the right way. What role did those geographic political differences play in the division? 
Did Peter Crable come from Katasufka or from Neumannovka? Does anyone know? And how do we find out? We find out if and when someone expended the time and effort to collect and preserve records. Next summer, Margo and I are going to Poland to learn something about her unique family history. She, as you may know, is from the other side of the Turkey Creek, way on the other side of the Turkey Creek, from Mountain Lake, Minnesota. As a plow teach, her ancestors lived in Poland longer than they lived in Russia. In preparation for that trip, we've been reading about Polish history. One of the books talks about the Warsaw Ghetto. According to Wikipedia, the Warsaw Ghetto was the largest of all the Jewish ghettos in Nazi-occupied Europe during World War II. It was established by the Nazis in the fall of 1940. There were over 400,000 Jews imprisoned there in an area 1.3 square miles with an average of 7.2 persons per room, barely subsisting on meager food rations. From the Warsaw Ghetto, Jews were deported to Nazi camps and mass killing centers. In the summer of 1942, at least 254,000 ghetto residents were sent to the Treblinka extermination camp. The death toll among the Jewish inhabitants of the ghetto is estimated to be at least 300,000 killed by bullets or gas, combined with 92,000 victims of rampant hunger and hunger-related diseases, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in 1943, and the casualties of the final destruction of the ghetto in, 19, in April of 1943, a destruction ordered personally by Adolf Hitler himself. This is what the ghetto looked like after the destruction. How do we know so much about activities in the Warsaw Ghetto? We know at least in part because among the committees formed by the Jewish underground was an archives committee. They knew that the Nazis would never include the story of the Warsaw Ghetto in their usable past. So they collected documents and stored them in metal boxes and cream cans. And all but one of those cream cans survived the final Nazi destruction of the ghetto. What an example of archival foresight. So who has collected and preserved and organized documents so that you can learn more about your unique past? The Mennonite Library and Archives at Bethel College. The following text and photos are largely the work of John Thiessen, co-director of libraries at Bethel and director of the MLA. John, incidentally, has three times achieved the highest score in the United States on the Academy of Certified Archivists exam. His second score has subsequently been matched by a couple of others, but John took the exam in the last year and scored even higher, making his score the highest ever recorded in the history of the exam. From John. Mennonite Library and Archives at Bethel College has multiple roots. First president of Bethel, C.H. Weidel, had an active interest in Mennonite history. He wrote a four-volume Mennonite history text, in German, unfortunately, and probably was involved in some collecting of historical materials at the college. In 1911, at the triennial session of the General Conference Mennonite Church in Bluffton, Ohio, a number of General Conference leaders, inspired by C.H. Weidel, who had died the year before, formed a Mennonite Historical Association. H.R. Voth, a former General Conference missionary in Oklahoma and Arizona, was active in the association and did most of the detail work. 
keeping ledgers of historical items collected. H.P. Crable was also an active promoter of historical interests and the association's collections were kept at his publishing office, Mennonite Weekly Review, for a time. Abraham Warkentine, a Mennonite refugee from Russia in the 1920s, professor of German at Bethel and a pastor at First Mennonite Church in Newton, became involved in collecting both with the association and the college. In 1939, the association turned over its materials to a new General Conference Historical Committee. Some of the materials were turned over to the college and some remained at the Herald Publishing Company. Here is a photo of the first home of the MLA in the basement of the old Science Hall, now the Will Academic Center. Cornelius Kron, another Mennonite refugee from Russia, came to Bethel in 1944 and became the most well-known promoter of historical collecting for the college and the General Conference. His involvement from the 1940s to the 1970s made him almost synonymous with the MLA. Also during these same decades, John F. Schmidt was the internal face of the archives, bringing organization to the records that had been and were being gathered and serving researchers who wanted to use them. He was also the keeper of many oral traditions about the archives. Despite its close ties with the General Conference Historical Committee, the General Conference only designated the MLA as its official repository in 1964. At that time, many records were transferred from the General Conference offices or the possession of individual General Conference leaders to the MLA. According to oral tradition, for example, P. H. Rickert, longtime chair of the mission board, had kept the mission records in breakfast cereal boxes. One month of papers per box. One can still see the bend in the paper from this storage method. Once the MLA became the official repository for General Conference archives, the conference paid an annual subsidy to Bethel College to support the collecting, organizing, and servicing of the records. When the General Conference gave way to the Mennonite Church USA in 2002, MCUSA covenanted to continue supporting the MLA to the tune, most recently, of $43,000 per year. You are probably aware that as a result of declining membership, MCUSA has determined that it can no longer afford that subsidy and it ceased entirely on 30 June 2017. The MLA is now funded entirely by Bethel College. The MLA currently has some 37,000 book volumes, 9,000 periodical volumes, 6,600 cubic feet of archival holdings, and about 1.2 terabytes of electronic records. Some 150,000 images are available on the MLA website, including scanned photos, scans from microfilms, and scanned paper documents. A little over a quarter of the MLA's archival records are from the former General Conference, 17% are Bethel College records, personal papers of individuals and families make up a little over a third. Usage of the archival records is concentrated in the personal papers and congregational records. Books and periodicals are mostly on the main floor of what used to be the college library from 1953 to 1986, shown here. The archival collections are stored in a variety of places, some not ideal in terms of climate control. A large part is stored in the basement of the old library building, which used to be the main public space of the MLA. The vault is also down here with rare books, some restricted archival items and framed art items. Another large segment of archival materials are in the MLA third floor, or attic, which is not climate controlled. There's another storage area in room 305 of the administration building. We also have materials stored at the MCUSA offices on Main Street in the former Faith and Life Press warehouse space. 
Some examples of the collections. Here's the classic image of archives. Paper documents, often typed rather than handwritten, neatly arranged in acid-free folders in order. Here's a newer way to access archives, quickly becoming a classic, documents on the web. These documents tend to be less orderly but more convenient. Anyone with an internet connection can look at these things. But obviously not everything has been scanned. John has calculated that the MLA has about 11 million pages of material. That would weigh roughly 64 tons. It would take around 13 years of eight-hour days to scan it all with current technology. And that doesn't count the organizing part of the job, just the scanning. You might think that archives contain old stuff, and you'd be correct. This is the oldest item on the Bethel College campus, and if I might, may say so, one of the most important. This is the third edition, 1522 Froben publication of the Greek and Latin New Testament published by Desiderius Erasmus. Or here's a night. Here's a nice Vandersmissen family tree from a book dated in the 1700s. Vandersmissen's claim to be able to trace their ancestry to Charlemagne in the year 800. The archives contain multiple languages. Here are some photos. This is a diary of Martha Voth, second wife of H.R. Voth, an example of legible German script. This is a page from H.R. Voth's diary an example of less legible German script. And this is an example of H.R. Voth's shorthand, an impossible German script. But there is also Cheyenne, Hopi, Russian, Dutch, Spanish, French, Polish, Hungarian, Japanese, Chinese, Hindi, etc. Some of the things in the archives are visually interesting. Here's a plat of an edition showing North Newton as part of the city of Newton in 1887. Here's an original drawing by Proudfoot and Bird, the architects who designed the administration building. There are a variety of technological formats, some of them weird. A wire recording, a umatic cassette, some of them pretty standard microfilm and CD. Sometimes you find documentation for things that never happened. Here's a fantasy map of Bethel College. I can recognize the Fine Arts Center and the administration building, but that's about it. And I have absolutely no idea what that is but it is possibly one of the finest basketball arenas in South Central Kansas, I don't know. And some things are just weird, like the Harry Bible. Clearly, the Mennonite Library and Archives is a treasure, but its future is at some level uncertain. MCUSA has ceased its critical subsidy though it has agreed to let the General Conference archives remain at Bethel. But space is obviously inadequate, staffing is minimal, environmental controls are needed. In an effort to ensure simple maintenance of the current situation with all its inadequacies, we are attempting to raise a $1 million endowment to replace that MCUSA subsidy. We are halfway there, with $506,000 pledged or in hand. We are asking folks to cherish this treasure, ensuring its continued existence and growth by contributing to the MLA operating endowment. And even after this lengthy presentation, you may be asking, why should I bother? If you care at all about Bethel College, about its Mennonite identity and its academic reputation, you should commit to cherishing the treasure of the MLA. Some years ago, the Kansas History Teachers Association had to change the rules for its undergraduate history paper contest 
so that Bethel students wouldn't win it every year. Why did Bethel students always win? It was in no small part because of excellent teaching by Keith Sprunger and Jim Yonke, continued now by Mark Jansen and Kip Weedle, but it was also because Bethel students had ready access to primary source material in the MLA and could therefore engage in the kind of research that professional historians do. As a result, their research papers were always a cut above the rest. In this Mennonite Church USA era, if you are still enamored of the General Conference Mennonite Church and its vision of progressive Mennonite theology, of caring more about preserving the central tenets of the faith and less about boundary maintenance, you should commit to cherishing the treasure of the MLA. MCUSA has decreed that those records will remain at Bethel College, and you can rest assured that the MLA will continue to collect any and all documents and personal papers that have a bearing on the history of the General Conference. Finally, if you have a passion and a hope for theological and ecclesiological renewal of the broader Mennonite Church, you should commit to cherishing the treasure of the MLA. Mennonites, perhaps more than any other denomination, have relied on the past for renewal of the present and preparation for the future. It happened to Tieleman Jans van Bracht in 17th century Holland with his publication of The Mirror of the Martyrs. It happened to Lauren and Pat Schwarzendruber in Iowa City in the 1960s. And it happened to Dale Schrag in 1969, largely in the Mennonite Library and Archives. At least 90% of my research for that social science seminar paper was conducted in the MLA. Dr. Cron gave me a key so I could go in and work after hours. I took Margot there on dates. She was not a bit impressed, <laughs> but she married me anyway. Don't deny current and future students and scholars the chance for an equally transformative experience. Cherish the treasure. Consider contributing to the treasure that is the Mennonite Library and Archives at Bethel College. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'll get out of your way. Thank you, Dale. Takes a little while for that to soak in. Uh, that was a tremendous presentation on the part of Dale and a tremendous case built for preserving and promoting the Mennonite Library and Archives. Very, very inspirational. Thank you a lot for that, Dale. I hope that we can all agree that this is a project that deserves our support and I trust that you'll take the appropriate action in supporting it. I guess this about wraps us up. Remember uh, if your membership's not up to date this is a good time to get it, to get it up to date. If you haven't by chance paid for your meal do so. Thanks for coming. Buy some books. Plan to come to the annual meeting in March. Visit as long as you like. Good night. <laughs>